Gospel according to the 20th chapter of Matthew. Glory Jesus said to the disciples, The dominion of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here all day idle? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. And when they received it, oh, when now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last works only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat? But the landowner replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this la to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It is so lovely to be here with you. Uh, I know most of you by now, but if I haven't met you, uh, my name is Pastor Chelsea Globe, and I serve as pastor for Lutheran Campus Ministry here at the University of Washington. Um, I have been in this role almost three years, and about two years, maybe two and a half, that we've been sharing space together here at University Lutheran. It's like a little, like we've moved in together, right? We've, we're committing to the relationship. I think it's going pretty well, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, hello to people who are part of my student community as well. So glad you could come out today. How many of you have uh, volunteered or donated or helped out with campus ministry in some way now or over the years past? Look around, that's a lot. Yeah. And it's super fun, right? It's really fun to be a volunteer. Our students are very thankful. <laughs> yes. Uh, so if you are interested in doing that, please come talk to me after the service. Uh, we've got a few uh, slots left in our quarter for bringing a, a meal on Wednesday nights. And it's just a fun time and a great way to uh, meet the students and, and let them know that you as a community, as a congregation, care about them, care about them in their lives. So uh, yes. We're getting ready for a fall quarter. Here we go, it is upon us. I also wanna say thank you for finding me such a great new coworker. <laughs> Welcome, Pastor Andy. <laughs> right, thanks for letting me horn in on your preaching schedule here for your second week uh, as, as your pastor here. But um, Andy and I have just had a great time getting to know each other and are really excited about the future and doing ministry together here at University Lutheran. So good job on you, everybody. He's a keeper, he's a keeper. So some of you remember last year during Lent, we teamed up uh, University Lutheran Church and campus ministry, and we did Wednesday evening stuff together, right? Yeah, so we did, uh, my students came for their meal, and then we did Holden Evening Prayer Service, which everyone loves. And then we had a discussion time after, and we built that discussion time themes theme around community after COVID. And I found five texts from the Bible that I thought would be helpful and fun and interesting to talk about it. 
Yeah, obviously, that's been an important topic for a lot of congregations and organizations and institutions as we've, we've moved into this new phase of, of post, somewhat post-COVID life. And from that time of discussion, those, those five weeks we were together, there's one discussion that really stands out in my memory. Now, I don't remember at all what text we were looking at, but we got onto the topic of membership and belonging. How do you know you belong somewhere? Some of you are, are nodding your heads. You remember this, yeah. And we talked, we started talking about church membership in particular. For many years, decades, probably centuries even, that was a way of knowing that you belonged. Church membership, right? A sure, solid sign that you belonged in a particular place. And of course, being good uh, mainline European roots Protestants, we have a very uh, proper process for that of membership, right? All the, the hoops you gotta jump through and the paperwork you have to do. Once you go through that process and get in the record book, you're on our list, there's even more process after that that you don't see. We leaders have to report our numbers every year how many members we have, how many confirmations we did, how many people by transfer we accepted, how many baptisms. And once a year, we send those reports to the bishop and they go towards all the data we collect in our denomination. So we have this clear membership process and and expectations, I think, of what it means to be a member of a church in the history of our denomination. And it reflects the values of those who came before who started the churches here, right? Order, stability, and good record keeping, important. And belonging, knowing you have a place, that you are a part of that community. Your name is on the list. And you never really had cause to question, I think in previous generations, that you truly did belong there. It was just an accepted part of life, a fact. Your name's on the list, you're good to go. And like most things in our society now, that process and feeling of of belonging and how we belong has shifted a bit. Because our world is different. We, as a society, are different. There's less pressure to conform to institutions. There's more freedom to explore and figure out who we are and what we want and where we truly belong. This became clear in that conversation that we had between church members and students. Our students and young adults told us about how hard it can be to know what their place is in a congregation at this point in their lives. They know they won't, probably won't be here forever. They know their presence in this community has an expiration date. And yet, they're here. They want to be known. They want to be part of this thing that we are doing together. They want to belong. And our formal church membership structure and processes hasn't quite been able to keep up with that reality for our young people. How do you check the box? How do you say, yes, sign me up, make me part of this, when you're not even sure what the next year will bring? And even in that instability, how do you still become a real, though temporary, part of the community? What is the place here? for people in that particular point of their lives. I think that we as a a whole, our denomination, or maybe it's all the mainline Protestant, any, any one of us who keep all these records and do all that, I think we need to rethink how we think about church membership these days. Maybe it made sense when the church was a, an important part of most people's lives when we all belong to various long-standing organizations, 
and had stable, stay put lives where we lived in one place for a really long time and we could really commit to the things there, right? But for a lot of us, it's, it's just not that way anymore. We like to hold up long commitments as something to be admired. When I visit churches, some of them, there's always a couple of people who want to tell me right away how long they've been members or how long their family has been part of that congregation. And that's great. That is something that we can celebrate and look to. And every year at Synod Assembly, we hand out certificates to those pastors and deacons celebrating ordination anniversaries with some of those, uh, those older guys racking up maybe 65 years of ordained ministry. Marriage is another example of a long-term commitment we celebrate. I wonder who here has been married the longest? Who do you think? Who do we think it is? These two? How long? 72 years of marriage. Wow. Wow. Congrats. And yes, that is extremely admirable. Put it, putting up with another person in that close proximity for that long? <laughs> that is impressive. And I'm sure you have lots of good advice you can pass on to younger generations and have. But here's my question. Does that many anniversaries give you a special hold over the institution of marriage itself? No. Does being a pastor the longest automatically make you the best pastor ever? No. Like I said, in many congregations, longevity or seniority is often prized, in some places more than others. And yes, that shows a commitment, which is fine and admirable, <clears throat> excuse me, but should longevity give us special privileges in a congregation? Should membership be defined by how much and how long of yourself you can give and keep giving? And for a congregation like this, like we have here, I'd say no. If there's not a way to actively include temporary people, college students, young adults, people in transition in a clear way into this community, then are we really in a, a university congregation? I know this is something you've all wrestled with for a long time, this, this piece of the identity of how to be a stable congregation, but in this particular setting. It's always a question for a university adjacent church. How do you truly welcome and invite and include those whose lives have very little stability into an institution that is founded on stability and that even measures our success with those numbers and reports by stability? We have to adjust our mindset when it comes to ministry and some of those basic facts of what it takes to be a congregation. Take a look at our gospel reading today. Some of you are probably wondering, is she going to talk about the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> our gospel reading today is that this wonderful parable about the landowner. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. This landowner that recruits workers throughout the day and keeps saying, yep, come into the vineyard, come in, come in, come in. And at the end of the day, gives them all the same pay. And the early birds, the one who were there, I mean, it must have been like 6 a.m. because the first number we're told is nine. And then they worked to six. Those guys worked like a 12 hour day out in that vineyard. It must have been harvest time. Those early birds, they complain. That's not fair, they're saying. We humans really like things to be fair, don't we? To be equal. But what Jesus is saying here is, in his kingdom, 
there isn't a special reward for our longest tenure or hardest worker. Whether you arrive early or late, you are treated the same in God's kingdom. God is just glad you showed up at all. It doesn't matter when or at what age or where you came from, showing up to the vineyard is enough. What a great lesson for our congregations and our ministries. We should be ready to welcome and give a chance to whoever shows up. That's what God's reign is like. There, our human ideas of fairness get completely turned upside down. Our job as followers of Jesus' way is to start living those kingdom values now. We need to let go of our institutional focus and adopt a people focus and joyously welcome any and all who show up to the party. And then, Equip them to join us in the vineyard. Vineyard party, mixing my metaphors, you know. No matter what their lives are like, no matter if they are here for the long haul or just a few months, no matter if they are born and bred Lutheran or taking their very first step into any church, no matter if they want to join the choir and the council, and do all the things, or if they just want a place where they can show up and be, and be known on a Sunday morning. I think we have started doing this, and I think we can do it even better. This is a part of the work that we, in this particular place, in our particular ministries that we are called to do together. Learn how to fully live into this identity as a university church, a place that welcomes and celebrates this special time in young people's lives and knows how to really make them feel welcome and celebrated and supported in whatever time we have with them. So how do we do that? I mean, we are getting started. Bringing a meal to campus ministry is one. I've got a sign-up sheet out there. <laughs> Show up to events we do together, like that Lent service, or this Thursday we're having an ice cream social and open house, bringing in the Ben and Jerry's truck again, uh, four to seven on Thursday here at the church. Maybe think about things like visual signs of welcome. Maybe have blank name tags for people to fill out if you don't already. Do you have them out there? I don't know. Because name tags are helpful in that you see someone's name over and over, but it also is a real sign of, oh, I'm a member. I've got the printed on. Uh, the, yeah, the special name tag, right? Maybe switch up what pew you sit in. Show you want to meet whoever comes to sit next to you that day. I know, that's big. (laughs) And make sure when you see someone new, go over and chat and invite them into coffee hour and then like walk them in and continue to chat or, or meet other people or if you're not good at that kind of thing, maybe do the initial hello and walk in and then hand them off to the people who are really good at chatting other people. Maybe have a guest book for students that they can fill out and keep, get their contact information or have things that on there like, I need help with laundry or a place to have Thanksgiving dinner or I don't know. There's a lot of things we can try as we're figuring this all out together. And I think really keep track of who keeps showing up. Who are those regulars who come who aren't ready to join, or maybe never will join, but are here, are here for the medium hall, and figure out how they want to be involved. Do they want to get more involved in some leadership? I know there's some uh, university congregations that have students on their 
council or part of their pastoral care team. So there are opportunities here that we can figure out what students need in a community, in a congregation, to feel included, and what they don't. What else? Other ideas. This is exciting. We have a time here when we can keep figuring this out. We can keep trying things and see what works and what doesn't. One thing's good this year, one thing's not the next, and that's okay. That's what we are here to do together in this work to which God has called us. And it won't always be easy. In some ways, this is more of an identity and a cultural shift than a specific activities or a plan. It's a shift of mindset. It's a consistent stance of welcome, of inviting, of care and commitment to those temporary friends who show up in our midst. As we move into this next phase of life together as our two organizations, now that we've got a couple of years experience under our belt, feel like we know a little bit of what we're doing and we have a settled pastor in place, let's keep this in mind. Let's keep thinking about this and trying new things and throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Let's keep playing with it, being open to wherever the spirit is leading us. And together, let us boldly pave the way and set a course for others to follow on how they too can be a church in our brave new world as we set a course not to membership, but belonging. Thanks be to God. Amen.